I made a little bit of an extra effort to get this recorded uh, because the weather for Sunday doesn't look real promising. It's already starting to sleet and snow on Saturday. Um, We got the idea for this series from our recent trip to Austin, Texas over Christmas. I thought I'd share a few photos from our trip with those of you who aren't on Facebook. Uh, We baked uh, cookies with our sons and their girlfriends. Uh, We did lots of hiking, uh, saw some beautiful scenery. Uh, We had uh, Christmas Eve lunch at a steakhouse and ate the biggest pork chops I have ever seen in my life. We ended up having a great time and we felt so blessed to have gotten to Austin on the day we planned to arrive and back to Indiana on the day we planned to return because that didn't happen for a lot of people. However, I did not post photos of the start of our trip on Facebook. Since this trip was our Christmas present to ourselves, Jeff and I opted to pay a bit more for a nonstop flight to Austin, leaving at 7 a.m. on Monday morning and arriving in Austin before 9 a.m. their time. So then we'd have the entire day to settle in and relax and plan the week. We opted to pay a little more to choose our own seats and to sit together. We opted to pay a little bit more to check a large bag so that we wouldn't have to do laundry three times and could fit in some small presents. We stayed with Jeff's dad in Indianapolis on Sunday night and got up at 4 a.m. to get to the airport earlier. When we arrived, this is what we saw. Not bad. However, we weren't flying on United. We were flying on American. And this is what the American line looked like. Now, the line might not have been quite that long when we got into it. But we heard the people who got into line behind us say, I have never seen lines like this. Once we realized that the line wasn't actually moving, I texted our son TJ and said, don't leave for the airport until you hear from us, because it will be a miracle if we make our flight. Well, there was no Christmas miracle. Full disclosure, we worried and fretted more than praying at that point in time. We had our boarding passes on our phones, and we debated whether we could repack our carry-on bags with a few essentials, get the large bag back to the car, and go straight to the gate, assuming we'd just buy what we needed in Austin. But at that point, we still had hope. Our irritation grew as people, intentionally or unintentionally, cut into the line in front of us as we neared the kiosks. Unfortunately, when it was our turn at the kiosk, we'd missed the window to board our flight. The kiosk spit out a piece of paper stating this fact, and we were directed to the rebooking line, which is the line at the right side of this photo. TJ was awake by then, and we strategized. I pulled up an Allegiant flight that got into Austin around midnight, and I was ready to click buy if American didn't come through. TJ started checking other flights and assured us he'd drive to Dallas, Houston, or San Antonio to pick us up if those turned out to be better options. The rebooking line moved nearly as slowly as the other line. And more savvy travelers than we are, like the family in front of us, had one person standing in the regular line, just in case a miracle happened, and one in the rebooking line so they wouldn't have to go to the end like we did. When we finally reached the desk, the man working there was awesomely calm. He first offered us a flight the next morning, and we had visions of the same thing happening. So we said, what about today? We offered to go to other Texas cities, but he said the problem was getting out of Indy. He could offer us standby to Charlotte around noon and then confirm from Charlotte to Austin. We imagined the hundreds of people who'd been in line in front of us who were probably also on standby. But we said okay, figuring we could book the Allegiant flight if we didn't make the one to Charlotte. For some reason, the man at the desk had to call someone to get permission to switch our flights. Suddenly, he covered the receiver and said the person he was talking to told him that if we were willing to go to JFK in New York, we would have confirmed seats on both legs of the trip. The flight to New York didn't leave until noon, and the flight to Austin wouldn't get in until almost 10 p.m., but we took it. The man printed our boarding passes, checked our bag, and directed us to the right gate. We hauled our carry-on bags and personal items to a table in the main concourse and sat down to collect ourselves. Jeff went to McDonald's and paid for his first Diet Coke in months while I texted TJ with the plan and tried not to cry at the delay in our trip. I only had a few tissues left and I would be wearing my mask for the next 13 hours, so crying was probably not a good idea. When Jeff got back to the table, we talked about how grateful we were to have gotten the confirmed flights 
and how our attitudes had not been very good during the waiting process. Words like selfish, entitled, and irritated came up. We decided it was time for a reset of our attitude. The start of a new year offers a great opportunity for a reset. Now, it's not a do-over. 2021 is gone and we can't get it back. But we can reflect on what we did, assess our decisions and habits, and commit to either continue them or make some changes in 2022. In this three-week worship series, we're going to look at what are known as the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke following Jesus' birth, as we pause to consider if it's time for a reset in some aspects of our lives, especially our spiritual lives. After the stressful start of our trip, Jeff and I chose to reset our attitudes. We committed to having a low-stress Christmas in Texas, and we've tried to continue that since our return. So instead of rushing through remembering, assessing, and committing all in one message, I'm going to invite us to be present in the process. This morning, we're starting with remembering. As we wrote our yearly New Year's letter, we never get anything out before Christmas, Jeff joked about using the famous line from A Tale of Two Cities to describe 2021. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Like any year, there were highs and lows for us and for the world. We spent time thinking about both. Now, I wonder what that exercise would have been like for Mary, the mother of Jesus. She had had quite a year. Her parents negotiating a contract of marriage for her was probably a little stressful. Who would they choose for her husband? Would he be a dream or a dud? Being told by an angel she would have a baby even though she was a virgin and not yet married having to tell her fiancé this bit of news and stressing over how he'd respond. It was fully in Joseph's power to divorce and disgrace Mary. It could even lead to her being stoned to death. Traveling to visit her cousin Elizabeth and visiting there for six months. Returning home with a now obvious pregnancy. Finding out she and Joseph would have to travel to Bethlehem while she was very pregnant. Whether she walked or rode a donkey, I imagine it was a long and comfortable journey then arriving in Bethlehem to discover there were no decent places to stay. Ending up in a manger with animals and going into labor there. Yeah, I'd say Mary had a year to rival 2020 or 2021. But it wasn't all bad, right? Joseph didn't divorce her. Elizabeth shared Mary's joy in being pregnant and confirmed what the angel had said about the baby Mary was carrying. And then her son is born, even if it's in a manger, and he's a healthy baby boy. Maybe the tide is turning. The scripture for this morning hits some highs and lows for Jesus' parents, especially Mary. The first section comes after the shepherds came to see the baby in the manger in Bethlehem, the Savior born to save his people from their sins. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby, who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds and all the people they spread the word to concerning what had been told about this child were amazed. When you have a newborn, it's so uplifting to have people say positive things about the baby. Oh, he's handsome, just like his daddy. She has that same determined grip as her mom. She's going places in this life. He's got the cutest nose. Her hair is a perfect shade of red. Now, hearing someone say, your son is a savior of his people. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Had to have been a high for Mary and Joseph. Angels lighting up the night sky, sending the shepherds on a hunt for the baby, wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger in Bethlehem. Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. How many times in the coming years did Mary reflect and remember this night that she treasured and pondered over? When Jesus was difficult to understand or to parent, we don't have many details, but you have to wonder if Jesus fit in with other kids or if he would have been labeled a little different by other parents. Did Mary close her eyes and remember what the shepherds said that night? Our second reading comes a little more than a month after Jesus' birth. According to Jewish law, Jesus would have been circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. 33 days after that, Jewish parents were commanded to dedicate their child to God and to offer a sacrifice for the mother's purification. 
I remember how joyful we were on the days we had our sons baptized in our church. Family came to celebrate with us. We dressed our boys up in nice clothes and we took photos to remember the occasion. As Mary and Joseph are in the temple for these rites, they are approached by a stranger. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Another high point in the year. My eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's mother and father marveled at what was said about him. But then Simeon had to keep talking. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. A sword will pierce your own soul too. Well, that's a bit of a downer. I wonder how many times after a joyous day with her son, Mary lay awake during the night remembering Simeon's words. Those are words that could give a parent nightmares. As we remember the year 2021, I'd encourage us to savor and celebrate the positives. The weddings, baptisms, births, reunions, birthdays, concerts, and sporting events you attended. The books you read and the music you listened to. The sunsets and the times in nature. The way you saw God at work in your life. Treasure these things in your heart. And when you think about the low times, remember how you got through them. No matter what we encountered, I can think of two factors that likely helped us to not give up. First, the people in our lives. Mary and Joseph had one another. Mary had her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant. The shepherds offered praise and adoration for the baby Jesus. And Simeon, another stranger, confirmed what the angels had told the new parents about their child. When Jeff's mom was sick this past spring, Jeff and I leaned on each other. Jeff's dad and siblings grew closer and used their different gifts to support one another and his mother. Trinity and Tyner Faithful prayed for and encouraged us. Even our stressful trip to Austin had people encouraging us. The man at the counter, our son offering to drive to get us from other airports in Texas, and Jeff's sister. His sister and her family were flying to Puerto Rico to visit her husband's family that same day out of the same airport. We texted to see what airline they were on and advised them to arrive with plenty of time. They did, and then they discovered their flight was delayed. Not only did they have to wait longer in the airport, but the flight was also delayed long enough they knew they'd miss their connecting flight in Atlanta. Jeff and Jane spent the rest of the day texting and challenging one another to find silver linings. We had a bag of caramel corn in our carry-on that we'd planned to give to our sons, but we could eat that rather than buying an expensive lunch. Jane had brought peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for them, and the airline would pay for their hotel in Atlanta if they were stuck there. We sent them a photo of our $36 dinner at JFK. They sent us a photo when they finally boarded the plane for Atlanta. Having people who encourage and strengthen you in life can make the difficult times easier to get through. I'd invite you to think about and remember the people who've done this type of thing for you in 2021. A second factor in Mary and Joseph's making it through a tough year was their faith. At the beginning of their journey as spouses and parents began with a visit from an angel. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. In fact, Mary and Joseph were chosen to be Jesus' parents because of their steadfast faith and trust, trust in God. When the angel spoke to them, they listened. They obeyed God. 
In our scripture today, we see that they kept the law of Moses in having Jesus circumcised and dedicated. They made the required sacrifices for Mary's purification. I imagine throughout the year preceding Jesus' birth, they worshiped, prayed, and followed the law faithfully. Imagine what strength and comfort that would have given them in the difficult times. When people talked about Mary's pregnancy, unwed, when they discovered they'd have to travel to Bethlehem, when Simeon said, and a sword will pierce your soul. My guess, guess is if you're listening today, faith has played a role in helping you weather the storms, disappointments, and maybe even tragedies you encountered in 2021. Psychologists say that even positive events can be stressful. So if you factor in the death of a parent, moving, changing jobs, and taking classes, Jeff and I have had another stressful year. On top of all the COVID-related decisions we've had to navigate for ourselves and for the churches. But long drives to Indy gave Jeff quiet time to pray. Having one less church to plan for after June gave us more opportunities for Sabbath time rest. Even in our stressful rebooking experience, when we stop to pray and measure our attitudes and words by the way Jesus calls us to live, we had faith we could turn the day around. Maybe we experienced a Christmas miracle after all. Where in your life has faith kept you going? This fall, we did a worship series called Keeping Company with Jesus, exploring spiritual disciplines, which are activities and attitudes designed to help us know Jesus better and to live out our Christian faith more consistently. My invitation to you this week is to remember how, where, when, and how often you practice some of these spiritual disciplines. I extend this invitation not to assess a score, but for some honest reflection time. Next week, we'll dig deeper into how we might reset for 2022. But before then, I'm inviting us to take some time each day to remember what our spiritual disciplines looked like in 2021.